Hello and welcome to Beyond Top 10 Tennis. My name is Dr. Ashley Morgan Burge and I'm your host. I'm the author of 11 books, a CEO of 12 years, a founder of a startup set on data privacy and social networks. I'm an elite performance coach of over 18 years, having worked with athletes throughout Europe, the United States to Australia. And most succinctly and specifically, I am the world's leading scientist on coach and athlete performance, and specifically the scientist that uncovered the landmark world first findings on how to develop a top 10 tennis ranking. That's right, specifically we have the keys now we have the data, we have the, the statistical significance there, but how to develop a top 10 ranking and how we uh, apply that and make that happen in the real world with all, just all of the work we know. And that's why Beyond Top 10 Tennis is here to unpack it all and to share additional insights. Um, I'm behind um, such theories as the optimal performance theory, the V by Dr. B to the rule of transference. I've coined terms from the barrier breaker to the golden rule that we have even touched on in previous episodes. Now look, as in each episode, we've been unpacking and sharing additional insights into one of these books. And we've been focusing on the secrets to optimal performance success, a comprehensive discussion on developing elite coaches and players. And look, today's episode is no different. We've been diving into functional movement. And I think today's, I think, little key that, that you know, that missing link there, it's so fundamental and so important. So buckle in and enjoy today's episode. And I can guarantee you there are some really good nuggets to take home and apply in your own training practices to incorporate into your own training loads specifically when we're looking at the long game and developing that top 10 tennis ranking. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, look, we're looking at the secrets to optimal performance success and we're continuing that trend or that pattern on functional movement because we are, you know, halfway through that book now when we're really diving into functional movement and we've been starting to unpack, I guess, the, you know, the nitty gritty details of what it really means to apply these, I guess, patterns into our training loads, our techniques and be mindful of these practices. Now look, if you'd like to follow along, we're on page 111 and it's 3.3 functional movement momentum. And look, before I get started, momentum has to be the most easiest, the simplest, I think, functional movement pattern to parameter, um, irrespective how you'd like to term it, that is so um, underused, um, I think under acknowledged, misinterpreted, you name it. Uh, all I need to do is step out on a tennis court at any tennis academy and look if momentum is actually being used to taught, to incorporate, to, you know, conditioned. And, you know, more often than not, the answer is no. And surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, when we're looking at the more elite performance spectrum, so whether you're ranked, you know, 30 in the world, 50 in the world, 80 in the world, 500 in the world, or you're looking at developing, you know, uh, or achieving those first ranking points on, you know, the ITF to the ATP or WTA tours. Momentum, it is so underused, underutilized. Um, it's, it's incredibly ironic from that perspective because a lot of coaches, unfortunately, uh, teach their athletes, players to hit a ball, but not what the body actually does after to allow, I think, to, to not only optimize the shot, and obviously that's where the book obviously has been taught, 
coined because we're looking at optimizing our performances. Now we're really looking at optimizing our performances and that top 10 ranking all top 10 players have this in common and we know from I guess that scientific standpoint there are direct correlations there in their, their movement patterns um, and direct correlations with when we're looking at the kinetic chain um, from that more technical perspective but also how it's utilized um, and adopted to integrate it within their game irrespective i think if it's acknowledged or not because there are so many different terms um that this falls under it's more important to applicable to see if they are actually using it um, and um, more so um, and we won't really get into it now but more so if they are conscious that they are using it that's when the really good results happen and when we say really good results we're talking about you know the semi-finals to finals or grand slam championships <laughs> and um, I might be outdating this episode though Wimbledon is starting today which is incredibly exciting but we also know from a statistic standpoint those um, when, even when we're incorporating you know predictive analytics um, and the correlations there with the best players in the world we actually know who has a better chance of reaching you know the quarters to the finals to you know lifting that championship and it's not always and or necessarily those who are inside the top 10 because as we've shared in previous episodes there are patterns of progression that a lot of players um, to coaches to outsiders aren't familiar with and i've touched on this before about you know uh, most recently, players such as Makova, we know why she had such a good run at Roland Garros. We knew why um, Ribikina was poised to win her second um, Grand Slam championship and or to make that final as she did. We knew um, before Swiatek won her maiden uh, Grand Slam, before it even happened, which is so incredibly exciting. But, you know, it's so important to clarify here that, of course, there's no guarantee. But when, you know, you pair the data together and the progressions together and we look at the functional movement patterns to parameters, is their game being optimized or is there a missing link missing link there if their game is being optimized and if the golden rule is in place and you know you've got all these pieces coming together and essentially they're identifying as that top 10 tennis player even if their ranking is not saying it just yet we know that if they follow that trajectory that they are going to get there and that's i think the most um exciting to I think pivotal part of beyond top 10 tennis that we have all these uh, missing pieces we have all these links and the correlations and we're going to put them all together so we know when we put them all together such as momentum and if we follow that set trajectory from 800 in the world 500 in the world 100 in the world you know top 50 in the world and so on we know what happens when you continuously progress and that trajectory falls into place but we also know that why that trajectory stops or we know why it halts why players in you know 80 70 in the world they stay there and they never you know descend past the top 50 in the world and you know that's a lot and who would have thought momentum obviously plays that part now for those who are not familiar with the term momentum essentially is that you move through you move forwards or that's what we talk about specifically in the sporting context and here when we're looking at tennis and how it's integrated into our techniques so you can look at the serve and the natural momentum so natural functional movement we think you know the natural progression through the serve is to move forwards opposed to halt now we're not saying to move forward to serve and volley even though there is um you know that's ingrained in there within that we and you're really optimizing I think momentum to its full capacity but then again there's obviously 
different points and, and structures there for you know when uh, I think that's applicable and the game has changed so much and that is why serve and volley is not I think as entrenched in the game as it once used to be though it's ironic in the sense that why was it why was serve and volley so successful you know 20 30 years ago and you go well technology had not advanced the court surfaces were not as advanced I think that the different um, external factors were not as advanced with technology so if you only have your body to optimize your performance what can you actually naturally do whilst calling upon functional movement patterns to parameters and there you go it was so simple when you look at it from that perspective now the game has changed so much when we're looking at speed of movement and play now in previous episodes or the most recent we've touched on you know range of movement to your center of gravity now here in functional movement when we're looking at momentum we go when we already have those two let's say keys in place momentum is the literal next push so it's the push behind the ball that push and release and when we are looking at coaching this so for the coaches out there it's very simple to make sure you know the dialogue to language to I think the interpretation is shared between you know that coach athlete relationship and the exchange there and that you can naturally condition that player athlete to push through the ball to release through the ball and there is not necessarily a stop there is not a point where you go I'm done I'm gonna pull back because what happens when you pull back uh, prior to that natural release is that you are stopping that natural um, power behind the momentum, uh, the natural, I think, what underlies why it's so fundamental to essential because when we're looking at the kinetic chain and we can go all right the look at an elastic band for example when we look at elastic energy so if you have just an elastic band a rubber band and you pull it back and then you let it go and you can look at momentum in that respect even though that's more so an inference there to elastic energy when you let it go that band you go whoosh through the end forwards. Now the human body is capable of that with the right technique, the right technical uh, parameters integrated. Now you may recall from the previous episode how we looked at discrete skills to that serial skill. You know, elastic energy is part of that serial skill, but there are um, other discrete skills that, that make that obviously happen. Now, if we're really looking at that, that momentum framework, and I guess for the parents out there, you want to be mindful that the coach is allowing your child to use, I think, that, that natural progression. Because again, when we're looking at mitigating injury, and so obviously if you've been following along, you're familiar with that. Um, a lot of this work talks back to making sure we're obviously safeguarding the body by using functional movement and that's what it does when you um, adopt and integrate functional movement parameters in your performance not only are you optimizing your performance but you're also safeguarding the body so when we talk about functional we we go okay what's more natural opposed to you know that twisting those unnatural movements of the body that you know they may or may not cause you pain now but we know if you're twisting that muscle to you know those joints in an unnatural way we also know you're putting that added strain and pressure on those parts of the body that can have a, a detrimental effect maybe not immediately but but more so long term so again if we're looking long term and sticking for the long game so that minimum 10 years plus that additional other uh, 10 and we say that so you could be that eight year old uh, and you need that 10 years to reach that peak so when you're 18 and you're ready to step on tour you want another 10 so then 
you know, if you're with me, you're 28 by that stage. So we just use that as a blueprint uh, for longevity. Some players obviously last a lot longer than that these days into their, you know, early to mid 30s. Others, maybe not. They hang up their boots prior, the rackets. But when we get to incorporate functional movement into our game, we have a longer chance of making sure we're able to sustain that level of play. Now, I know this is a lot. So when we get back to momentum, it is a natural movement and progression. Um, Think of it when you were sprinting. Now, hopefully everyone out there listening, we've sprinted or done, you know, sprints at some point or stage in our life. So when you cross the finish line, when you were sprinting, do you just stop? Does your body just stop? (laughs) Of course it doesn't, because if you just stop, you're probably just going to fall over, right? You slow, you stop, and you with that is you slow down and you allow your legs to slow down until you natural naturally come to a slower and slower and finally you stop now when we apply that back to tennis we're preparing let's say for that forehand we're preparing for that ground stroke we make contact with the ball and we release through the shot so we we hit the ball now there are two options here you hit the ball and you just stay exactly where you are and unfortunately a lot of players do this a lot of juniors do this or there's a huge misconception even with elite coaches you hit the ball and you pivot with one foot and that's it that is it and when you do that you are you're halting you are halting that natural progression you are halting that natural trajectory and you're holding back um, which means you are not allowing that natural follow through on the other hand you make contact with the ball and you release and flow through now this can happen in different ways it could happen with the lower body that one i think forward pivot but the upper body is forward which means you finish in a forwards motion your whole body is a forwards motion where it's that forwards flexion Um, opposed to just hitting the ball and remaining upright Now, a lot of players, um, irrespective of what level you are at, if you're that junior, you're developing, you're that high performance player, you're at the academies, you are that 18 year old, you know, ranked 800 in the world, or, you know, it doesn't matter your level. You could be ranked top 50 in the world and this is still happening. You need to learn to flow, to follow through and flow through the ball now we use the obviously the lower body there and controlling our center of gravity to make sure one we stay balanced but we load there and we're going to touch on that later but when we're loading we're looking specifically at contact you're contacting the ball you want to flow through okay when you get to flow through you push through you're letting momentum take place you're releasing the momentum into the core and you go well why do I want to do that well obviously one it's a, it's a functional movement pattern and you're using your body there but two your body is combating your opponent's oncoming ball which means you're more able to integrate and use and absorb your opponent's ball and that power against them (laughs) which means that's less effort to energy on your part so you are optimizing your play by benefiting from your opponent's shot and you're allowed to then release through the ball more it is incredibly exciting rewarding uh it's such a natural way of optimizing our performances and i also feel like i'm giving you just huge fundamental secrets right now (laughs) and it is pivotal 
and that's what we find obviously the best players in the world they do but when we draw it back or um, refer back to you know science we also know from a scientific perspective that is how you develop those those endpoints those optimized results but we need to obviously integrate you know the science into the real world and you know that direct correlation with ranking and, the, and you know the technical parameters and that's what we've done so if you're you're familiar with the work you may or may not be that's where we go the v by dr b it's a technical parameter and we know it's directly correlated with top 10 tennis rankings when you adopt it and so that technical parameter that framework that's involved there integrates momentum now if you want to optimize your performance you want to become a top 10 tennis player you need to begin to implement and integrate momentum now you could be top 20 in the world if you want to get to the top 10 you need to begin to implement integrate momentum through your shots likewise if you are that 10 12 you know 13 year old just developing your shots you're looking towards progressing to that next level of play please also for the parents and coaches out there at that level please begin to integrate momentum because when we're forming that baseline the foundations of play at that level it means you're setting that player up for success in that 10 year you know in 10 years time for them to continue to you know follow that trajectory and optimize their performance and what we get when we create that baseline at the earlier years we're giving them the tools to better succeed and follow that long game towards that top 10 tennis ranking what happens if we don't and this is perhaps apparent for those players you know 70 60 in the world so when we don't it means they get stuck and they're less mindful of what's missing from their game or they they do become mindful and they do get to progress but they have to hover they have to hover around that ranking range for a period of time until they become privy to one the knowledge but two being able to uh, condition themselves and integrate these new practices and more often than not when we're integrating that new skill we need to remove the old and in order to remove the old we get a performance regression which means our ranking slips you could be 60 70 in the world and next thing you know you're 120 in the world because of that regression in you know that technical parameter whilst you are learning to condition and adopt that new technical parameter and then you'll be set at progressing but what we're saying that if we set it up earlier on um, from a more um, mental perspective you don't have to suffer <laughs> um, that regression because you know from that you know mental uh, standpoint mental and emotional standpoint it definitely sucks when your ranking slips you're on that trajectory and it doesn't matter if you're on the WTA or ATP tour and that happens or you are you know that 13 14 year old you're, you're on the ITF or you're playing you know your local events when we see a regression oh geez and I've been there you know from that place perspective is hard heartbreaking it still sucks and I know a lot of us get so upset at ourselves but when you go through this and you're working on a regression so you can progress um, be kind to yourself um, and that's especially important for you know the parents and coaches out there to be mindful and to have those conversations with your you know the child your child your children your players and on your athlete to say you know this is going to happen and it's okay because we are working through I guess these um, discrete skills to optimize the serial so to optimize the actual you know that flow through now when we get to do that then we're on that pathway for optimal performances um, and obviously the later you leave it then you can regress and I think it's quite uh, detrimental when you see a top 20 player they regress back to 50 60 in the world oftentimes for these reasons and then they progress again and that's okay 
but when you are at that level of play the hits are harder um, as in you know the setbacks end up being harder because you lose that grip so to speak by being within or on the cusp of the top echelon of play and then you need to work your way back and within you know that period you've got the next generation of play that I term it that's knocking on the door so it's in a way easier to stay there whilst you're at that optimal level of play and continuing to progress opposed to regressing and then progressing it obviously is done each and every single day but you get to choose how you want to handle that now again if we set ourselves up with momentum to begin with with functional movement parameters now and we don't wait if regardless if you're top 30 in the world let's set ourselves up now then we have a greater chance of getting inside and becoming a barrier breaker so it's so important to fundamental all right this has been um a lot but i hope that you've gotten um a lot out of this so before we wrap up uh, i really want to share some additional insights from the chapter so again if you're following we're on page 111 in order to create fluid momentum athletes need to be conditioned in a way that allows this to happen naturally i use the word fluid to indicate a more natural state of momentum a flowing movement in contrast to one that is structured and has a tightness about it which restricts the athlete from being bodily free this is such a good one because i mean i even remember this being said to me which is kind of goes to show that this has been around for a long period of time but the conversations are not being had now or neither back then about the benefits and how we can make it happen um and i reference this tightness because you may or may not have heard in the past that your movement could be somewhat robotic and i say that because you stand there on the baseline or irrespective of the court where you are but we'll we'll say baseline and you hit the ball and you stay there and the ball keeps coming and you obviously keep hitting it and you know it looks your strokes your ground strokes look really clean and you're happy with them but you stay there and your upper body is stay there it's very robotic robotic rather than that fluid motion where you're releasing and you're able to pivot through your lower body and then release through your upper body and use momentum behind each and every ball because that's where your footwork comes in that is why the messier your footwork is the up back up back up back why why do some players move up back up back obviously there's so, there's a um, you know that lateral movement in there as well but it's always an up back up back uh nadal is a huge uh i think champion of this likewise with Djokovic, an up back and even if they are on the baseline you will still see that minor shuffle that up back up back sweet so taken a sock exceptional at this and body were exceptional at this the top women in the world are exceptional at this as well l crazy is except they're all top 10 players are exceptional at this up back up back the lateral movement as well up back up back because as soon as we move back to move forwards that's momentum we we're building that momentum behind us to allow it to go through that forwards so it's up back up back up back even with the lateral movement up back up back up back so if there's anything that you can take away today and if you are a bit more robotic and you really want to start integrating momentum into your game now for the coaches out there especially and you know the athletes and players that you know that small step that you can take to look at integrating momentum into your game is look at your footwork to begin with and obviously that there's so much more involved here but just to keep it really simple we'll say just that up gap and learn to release through the ball so when you hit the ball opposed to being stationary exactly where you are one of my favorite training drills when i'm conditioning an athlete to to 
uh, integrate momentum into their game, to feel what momentum is like. Make sure you place, you know, a marker, whether it's, you know, a cone or, you know, a triangle of balls. You know, let's look at a metre to, to a metre and a half to two metres in front of your hitting point. So it is a visual cue to remind you to release through the ball. Now we use those visual cues to allow us to flow through and it's a reminder. Eventually you can, you know, move it away. Only, only when you begin to go, okay, you know what it feels like. But until you feel the difference until you know the sensation there so until your whole body your lower body and your upper body is working in um, unison with that uh, momentum and you're starting to condition what that is like keep it there keep them there because that cue is incredibly important to more purposely condition momentum into your brain. Okay, uh, I'll just read another small section. Um, here we go. Momentum is a bodily free action that is often the result of the use of a functional movement. A functional movement being free or natural in nature places less stress on the body and allows the body to move functionally, generating momentum. Momentum is used in sporting performances when an athlete applies a technique, moves with purpose or in any other instance where energy is created due to momentum being in effect. This is so important. So you would have seen it's, it's free and it's a release. It's in effect. It's how we're placing less stress on the body. We're using our whole body to our advantage. We're getting so much, I guess, wins, so to speak, from our body just by learning to move it naturally. Uh, look, momentum is just so important and it's often, I think, overlooked. And look, now we've, you know, we've touched on our center of gravity, we've touched on our range of movement, and now we have momentum. And these are three pivotal parts of our game, our foundations, our techniques to everything that underlines our performances, specifically when we want to optimize our performances and follow that long game, follow the pathway towards that top 10 tennis ranking. So if we're able to um, progressively condition these proponents in our game, specifically for the coaches out there, you're setting that player athlete up for success. For the parents out there, this is so much more important to fundamental because we're talking about safeguarding the player and mitigating injuries. I think from that other standpoint for the players then and the athletes when we're looking at optimizing our performances to head towards that top 10 to have that chance that potential of becoming that professional tennis player being on the WTA and or ATP tours and being in the top 50 in the world and progressing to top 30 to top 20 to top 10, there's obviously nothing more rewarding. And obviously, if we are integrating these functional movement patterns of play, then we're on the right page, we're on the right trajectory to head towards that top 10 tennis ranking. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, to get a copy of The Secrets to Optimal Performance Success, head on over to AM8 International. That's am8international.com. Uh, for any comments or questions, again, head on over to AM8 or Topic Thread. That's the only social network I am on. Uh, we do have accounts. Uh, Beyond Top 10 Tennis is on TikTok, um, Instagram, Twitter to LinkedIn. So if you are on any of those platforms, please reach out and also 
say hi. <laughs> um, I may not receive them all. I will try to, but I would absolutely love to hear from you as well. Um, if you'd like something different, then please head on over to Pink Octopus Books. That's where my fictional release is. Um, look, all of the links are in the bio and the show notes. Um, if you've enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, follow and like. That would be absolutely phenomenal. Um, also, where if you are on, you know, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, we are a little bit late to the game in that respect. So I would personally really appreciate your support and getting the word out there because at the end of the day, not only are we mitigating injuries um, in athletes around the world, specifically when we're looking at tennis, um, but also setting up the next generation of play. Whether you are actively on the WTA or ATP tour heading towards the top 10, we want to set one another up for success. If you are 800 in the world and you want to progress towards the top 100, that's what we're here for. If you are that aspiring player, no ranking points yet, but you want to get there, we're building the foundations to get you there with the long game. So irrespective of what level of play you're at, um, sharing beyond top 10 tennis, uh, specifically from that scientific perspective, we're here to help. So the more we get to share that, you know, the better. Um, on that note, I am so grateful and thank you so much for those of you who have been following her on from the start. Um, I hope we have been getting better. Your feedback is incredibly appreciated. Please do keep it coming. Um, I am your host, Dr. Ashley Morgan-Burge, and this is Beyond Top 10 Tennis, and I'll see you next time.